Hello, I'm Dr. Derwin L. Gray, co-founder and lead elder pastor of Transformation Church, and I want to welcome you to 40 Days Through the Book of Ephesians. I'm looking forward to journeying with you. We're going to journey back 2,000 years and look into the world of the Apostle Paul and how God used this gospel, which is a bigger, more beautiful, richer understanding than we can realize. Not only will it transform our lives, but we will become a conduit of God. God's transformation. You ready? Let's go. The Apostle Paul visited Ephesus in his second missionary journey. Uh, it, it, was, it was a city that was filled with idolatry. There were, there were temples to various Roman gods all over the place. And there's the Apostle Paul planting the flag of Jesus's cross that the God that so loves the world has come in the person of Jesus Christ, not only forgive sins, but to create this new family that, that lives in the grace and mercy of God to show the world, this is what love and life with God looks like. So Paul is writing to the churches in Ephesus from a prison cell in Rome, the Apostle Paul uh, was there and helped build these brand new upstart multi-ethnic churches. And the problem was, was this, is that Jews and Gentiles were having a difficult time getting along, which is very understandable. When you look at the history of Jewish people and Gentile people in the first century, you gotta keep this in mind. For Jewish people, they view Gentiles from this historical perspective. For 400 years, they were slaves in Egypt through Gentiles. And then the Canaanites, Hittites, and Zebubites, and Prezuvites, and probably Ants did bite. They were Gentiles. They tried to destroy the Jewish people. And then when the Jewish people did get to the Promised Land, because of their disobedience, another Gentile power, the Babylonians, carried them into captivity. And then now, in the Promised Land and throughout the Greco-Roman world, the Roman power structure suppressed and oppressed the Jewish people. And so therefore, the tensions were already heightened and resurrection power was required for Jews to love those who had mistreated them so badly. But also for Gentiles, Gentiles knew that a Jewish attitude for the most part towards them was, you're immoral, you're unclean, therefore we can't even be around you. And so what the gospel did is it broke down these demonic powers and began to build them up into the people of God that loved each other for the glory of God. In AD 58, the apostle Paul was under Roman imprisonment. Uh, but, but what was he doing? One of the things that he was doing is he was pinning a letter uh, scholars call it a circular letter because it was written to various churches in what we know as Ephesus or modern day Turkey. And he was writing specifically to these young, impressionable Jesus communities called ecclesias or churches. And, and what was unique about these churches, which was unparalleled in the first century, second temple Jewish world, that was occupied by Greco-Roman supremacy was this, is that these, these young churches were multi-ethnic. They were transcultural. They were social economically diverse. They, they, they had Jews in them and they had Gentiles. And by the way, a Gentile is everybody else except for Jews. Now, they would have known that the Apostle Paul had this thing about getting in trouble, and so they would have figured that he probably was in prison because we know from Acts chapter 21, 28, and 29 that he had been arrested for bringing a gonim, a Gentile, into the Jewish temple. Uh, the Apostle Paul could not help himself. He was, he was always getting in trouble. Why? Well, we get to understand the why when we peer into the heart of God manifested through the Apostle Paul and his ministry and the writing of this incredible, beautiful book. So in the first century, in Paul's world, it was 
even more racially divided than our 21st century. Uh, let's never forget that, that racism misses the mark. God's mark, God's goal, the word sin means to miss the mark. God's goal is for humanity to love each other as expressed through the person of Jesus Christ. It is a, it is a sacrificial love, it is a giving love, it is an affirming love, it is an inclusive love. It's a love that looks like the cross, it's a love that looks like the empty tomb. And so the Apostle Paul, in this racially divided world gave his life for this revolutionary idea that the precious blood of Jesus not only forgives sins but creates a family with different colored skins and his family is a family of oneness well let me give you an illustration so um, as you can tell from my physique I don't eat a lot of salads, but I do from time to time. So I want to give you an illustration that oftentimes we, as human beings, we kind of like to hang out with people who are like us. And so uh, we kind of got lettuce churches, you know, where lettuce likes to hang out. And then we got pepper churches where pepper likes to hang out. And you have onion churches and, you know, and then you got bacon bit churches. Those are definitely Gentile churches. And then you got tomato churches. And then you got corn churches. Now, all of these ingredients are pretty good, but if you start doing this, get a little bit of lettuce. Hold on, let me get a little bit of lettuce, a little bit more lettuce, and you put some lettuce in, and then you get some of these colorful uh, 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 peppers. Oh my gosh, and the onions. You can't Mm, praise the Lord for some good onions. They're strong too. You put the onions in there. You need some strong personalities. And then you need some, some tomatoes. Let's just sky hook those in there like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Put those in there. And you got to get some corn. Yep, yep. Corn is good for you. Put that in there. And my goodness, you cannot forget about some bacon, right? You just got to just put it on there. And before you know it, you go, oh my gosh. And then you... You gotta get some dressing because what dressing does is is it puts all the flavors and it makes all the flavors come out. And so lettuce by itself is good, corn by itself is good, onions by itself is good, tomatoes by itself is good. But when you put it all together and you mix it up, you you have this salad. Well, what God wants to do is he wants to create this, this salad bowl family where all the flavors and all the textures in Christ have been redeemed. And this is what happens. And this is what was happening in Paul's day. And this is what happens in our day is that when we stay isolated with just the sameness, we stay in stuckness. And just like a multifaceted diamond, every time you shape it, you get a different glimpse of its beauty. Well, Jesus' church, when you bring all of God's people together in Christ, it's our differences that makes us different for the better. So Paul, in the book of Ephesians, is reminding Jews and Gentiles, he's reminding you and me, regardless of what your ethnicity is, that we have been reconciled vertically to God. The word reconciliation means this, that, that we were divorced and now we're remarried. It means we were separated, but now we're together. Jews and Gentiles have been reconciled vertically to God and horizontally to each other through the redemptive work of King Jesus. That we are now the people in Ephesus, the Jews and Gentiles, and us in Christ now, that they are now the single multi-ethnic family that God promised Abraham. Uh, friends, this is, this is massive. In Genesis 11, God's family scatters. In Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, through you, I'm going to give you a family, and it's going to be like all the stars. It's going to be this big old family made up of all the families or ethnic groups on earth. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 3, 4 says this. By reading this, you're able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. What is the mystery of Christ? This was not made known to the people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. 
The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body. Now watch this, partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What's the promise? The promise is this, God told Abraham, I'm gonna give you a family, and this is the family that God has always wanted. You see, the cross is bigger than just individual forgiveness. As great as that is, God is saying, I'm getting my family back. God is a promise keeper. He's a covenant fulfiller that when Jesus came, he was God's guarantee that he's going to fulfill his promise. Think about about this. Because you're in Christ, regardless of your ethnicity, not only are you forgiven and reconciled, you are the very promise that God promised Abraham. So, So how does God in Christ take enemies and make them family. How does he do it? Well, because God creates this new multi-ethnic family, we are blessed. Check this out. So the Father chose us from above. Let's look at Ephesians chapter one, verses one through six. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. If you're in Christ, you are blessed in Christ. Well, what is the blessing? Paul tells us, I'm so glad you asked. He says this, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be what? Holy and blameless in love before him. Let's pause here. In the first century, Second temple Jewish world of Jesus and Paul, the idea of chosenness or election meant this. It meant that you are chosen for a purpose and a task. And the way you get into that chosenness is by faith. And so Jesus recapitulates or rewrites the story of Israel. And so like Luke 9, 35 says that Jesus is the chosen one or elect one. Before the foundations of the world, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself, chose that the humanity of Jesus would be the person that is set apart and chosen to redeem the world and give God his family. And so through faith in Christ, we become a part of his chosenness. And watch this now, what's true of Jesus is now true of you. Everything that's true of Jesus is now true of you. I know it's not fair. We don't want fair. That's why it's called grace. And grace creates this new race that is blessed in Christ. The Father chose us to be what? Holy and blameless. Holy means to be set apart. We we belong to him now. His agenda is ours. His redemptive purpose is ours. His life is ours. And the word blameless means this. Jesus has eradicated and erased all of our sin. We are blameless because of the blood of Christ. And he does this in love before him. The motivation is love. Our Abba loves us. He predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ for himself. God has adopted us through Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. Now watch this, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. We we praise him because God says, you are in my son. I, I have adopted you. You didn't earn it. You didn't achieve it. It's a gift that only you can receive. It's not by your worth. It's because of your new birth into the family of God. How does God do this? How does he make enemies into family? It's because the son redeems us with his blood. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10 says this, in him, there's a beautiful word, in him, we're in Christ, in him, we have redemption through his blood. The word redemption means to buy back, to set free. It comes out of the Exodus. It comes out of the Exodus story. The story where God sets Israel free because of the blood on the door. Well, the blood is no longer on a door. The blood is on you and Jesus has redeemed you. Jesus has set you free from what? Sin and death and evil. He has set you free from those things for becoming a part of his new transcultural multi-ethnic family. The forgiveness of our trespasses, watch this, according to the riches of his grace. The recession does not affect God's grace. 
it's infinite. That he poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on the earth. What that means, what Paul is talking about is the beauty and the supremacy of Jesus that through his redemptive work that even creation one day will be healed in the new heavens and new earth. The power of Jesus's blood is immense. It is a healing and transformative and all things will become new one day. How does God turn enemies into friends? It's because the Holy Spirit seals us with his love. Verse 11, here it is again, in him, in Christ, we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. Let me tell you really, really quick, God isn't worried, you don't need to worry. There's never been a moment that God did not know your situation or your circumstance. He knows it, he's already planned for it, and God's greatest purpose for predestining us is this. You are predestined in Christ to be conformed to the image of Christ. Predestined simply means this, to prepare beforehand. So everyone who has faith in Christ, God has decided beforehand that we can walk in holiness, that we can walk in blamelessness. God is more concerned about our character than our comfort. Verse 12, so that we who are already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. You see, our hope is in Christ and we bring praise to his glory. Let's look at Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. Here it is again. In him, you also were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. So this is us outside of Christ. Jesus is the elect one. And when we exercise faith in Christ, we are now in him. And so what does God the Father see? What do you and I see? We, we see Jesus. Why? Because we're in him. And then the Holy Spirit seals us for all eternity in Christ. Everything that's true about Jesus is true about us. And it's not just so that our little lives can get better. It's so that we can be the transcultural, multi-ethnic family of God that has been predestined to walk in holiness and blamelessness and love. God brings us into his family so that we can image forth Family characteristics, and what are those family characteristics? Praise of his glorious grace and also resurrection power. How does God bring enemies into friends? What well, Paul is telling the young multi-ethnic churches of Ephesus who are dealing with all types of racism and then your own personal sin and all types of oppression and, and a crazy chaotic world just like us, he's saying keep your eyes on the cross. In the midst of the chaos, look at the cross. In the midst of the fog, look at the cross. In the midst of uncertainty, know for certain that he walked up out of that tomb. Never forget this. Jesus borrowed Joseph of Arimathea's tomb because he wasn't on plan. He was not planning on staying there three days, and he was out. Why did he come out? So he can come in to your life. Check this out, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Saints means holy ones. God's pe people are called holy ones because we are in Christ. Christ is holy. He's set apart for God's purposes, so are we. Christ has no sin. We're seen as though we have no sin. That's why Paul says we are blameless. I know it's not fair. That's why it's called grace. We don't want fair. We want grace, and he makes this new race. Verse 16, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened 
so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength? He exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. So the Jesus who rose from the dead lives in Jews and Gentiles. The Jesus who rose from the dead now lives in Latinos and African Americans and white people and people who are black and white at the same time and Asian and rich people and poor people and male and females. This Jesus who rose from the dead lives in us. The Father chose us in Christ. The Son redeems us by his blood. The Holy Spirit seals us with his power and the resurrection power of the Spirit lives in us to do what? to be holy and blameless in love, to love each other and image forth to the world. This is what love and life looks like as God's new race of grace called the church. So what is our soul tattoo? Uh, uh, what is it that, that we grab from this chapter one? It's this, we are the family God promised Abraham. We are chosen in Christ, redeemed in Christ, and sealed by the Spirit so we can fill the earth with the supremacy of Christ. I'll catch you on session two.